Welcome to Witchlit, a place to talk about the craft of writing and writing the craft. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, author, publisher, witch, and nosy Scorpio. Witchlit is brought to you by Thousand Volt Press, a family-owned independent publisher established to produce the books we want to see in the world. Titles including Changing Paths by Yvonne A. Burrow, Conjuring the Commonplace by Lane Fuller and Corey Thomas Hutchison, A Death in the Dry River by Lisa Allen Agostini, and my most recent book, Verona Green, can be purchased directly from thousandvoltpress.com or wherever you buy books. You can also support the show by buying us a cup of coffee at ko-fi.com slash witchlitpodcast. Kate Fruller is the author of Blood and Bones, Working with Shadow Magic and the Dark Moon, and the upcoming book Magic at the Crossroads, The Devil in Modern Witchcraft. She lives with her family and wonderful cat in Ontario, Canada, and has been studying the occult for most of her life. Alongside writing, Kate has many creative projects underway at any given time and is always working on learning new mediums. Kate Fruller, welcome to Witchlit. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you on. I'm excited to talk about your book. Well, actually books, because I've read both of your books. Um, but before we get, delve into all of that, our first question for everybody on the show is, you know, especially in this age of visual medium and short attention spans, you know, why write? Why still write books? Uh, for me, I have a lot of trouble sometimes putting my thoughts into words vocally. So with things like social media and videos and little quick TikToks and things like that, I'm just not that speedy. <laughs> I like to really think before I put something out into the world and writing lets me do that. I can look at it again and be like, nope, that's not what I meant. And I don't know, maybe it's sort of neurotic on my part, but that's why I prefer writing instead of all the other mediums. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as for why I write in general. I ask myself that question a lot because <laughs> sometimes, um, I mean, I love writing, which is why I do it. It's almost a compulsion and I'm always writing publishable, not publishable journals, thoughts, lists. It's just what I do. And, um, but when it comes to writing books, it's sort of like, why am I doing this? <laughs> like sometimes it's hard to write a book. It's not mm -hmm. an easy thing to do. And then sometimes it kind of sucks. And so why write? Like, and I, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just do it. I think that's a great answer, though. I mean, I think there is, and so many writers, a compulsion to write. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, if I'm going to do this all the time anyway, I might as well make it into something. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, I have so much writing, piles and piles and piles of writing that's not ever going to be published and wasn't meant for that anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's therapeutic sometimes. And I don't know. I just kind of can't stop doing it. Yeah. No, no, same. I mean, I'm a, um, I'm a serious note taker. Like when I go to lectures or anything like that, just piles of notes, journal every day, you know? Yeah. It's the same. It's just, you know, I'm always writing whether I'm working on an official writing project or not. So. Yeah. I same. Definitely feel that. <laughs> so, um, your first book of Blood and Bones um, has been out for a while, right? Yeah, it came out in 2020. So it was a strange year all around. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, so what was getting that first book published like? So what was that experience like for you? Well, it was it was different than I expected. So all of my life as someone who writes, I thought, you know, writing a book and having it published is like a dream, right? Like that's something I always wished for. And to finally have a shot at doing that was a really big deal. And I was like, wow, okay, my young self wanted this. That's so cool. But then to have it actually happen, I didn't realize how exposed I would feel because, you know, you write a book, it's got really personal beliefs and thoughts in there. And um, yeah, I, I realized, okay, this is actually not that I thought it would be so joyful and wonderful, but it was actually kind of scary. Mm -hmm. So there, that was a big part of it. And I thought, oh man, like the internet is going to tear me apart. This is going to be awful. What have I done? <laughs> and then, um, you know, some time passed and I was like, okay. 
And um, yeah, so they, that part was like, I didn't expect it to feel so, so, so frightening. And um, I was surprised by like the process of publication takes several, like a couple of years. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time. So like of Blood and Bones, well, I mean, I started writing it, journaling and stuff, bits and pieces in like 2016. But when I actually submitted like, you know, the sample writing and things like that, from there, it took like a year and a half, maybe a little longer. Um, So that was surprising. But all in all, like it was, it was pretty good. I'm okay with it. I don't know how the next one is going to be received. I'm kind of having the same sort of anxieties about that. But Mm -hmm. again, maybe it'll pass in a couple of years. We'll see. I was thinking when you said, you know, about feeling exposed and just kind of like how people are going to react to it. I was like, you kind of double down on your topic. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I did think to myself, like, at first I was like, I don't know if I'm going to write another one because I didn't really, I I thought Llewellyn wouldn't publish a book about the devil. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I had asked a little and they're like, "Mm, we try to stay away from something like flat out Satanism, you know, and I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, that's fine. And I thought, okay, well, that's the only topic I really want to write about next. Um, And I thought to myself too, I was like, if I do write another book, like I can't just go from like a blood and bones and then be like, okay. And now here is a beginning book about um, visualizing joy. Like, I just feel like that wouldn't work. (laughs) Yeah to make that kind of switch. And I mean, it's not like I'm all darkness in my life. I'm, I'm lots of things, but um, I thought, okay, well, if I really am going to write another book about something that is important to me and that is genuine, it's going to have to be that subject. That's all I got for Mm -hmm. the next book. (laughs) So, and as it developed, Llewellyn was more on board because it wasn't just straight out devil worship, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, I think, it's one of those things like when Marcus mentioned it to me, because I didn't know the book was coming until Marcus, who for listeners is the PR person from Llewellyn that I usually deal with. Um, I wasn't exactly sure. So I kind of went into it blind when I started reading. And I love that it's really like almost a um, kind of an intellectual history of the idea of like Satan and Lucifer and the witch's devil and all of that. And kind of how we, this is a concept from ancient time, really. But this idea of this, like, the I guess the Christian devil is really like the newest, I don't know, almost, like you talk about it in the book, almost the newest egregore of this idea of the adversary that we've always had, like, throughout different religions and times. And, um... I can see how they were like, oh, this is a different book. <laughs> like you said, it's not like, oh, here's how to become a Satanist. It's really like, here's why people have these conversations and why it's difficult to talk about this, especially in occult spaces who are still recovering from satanic panic stuff. And, you know, I, th- I think that approach to it was really interesting. Um, so I guess what, like, what did you kind of see like the, as you were writing the book, like what, I mean, I guess, what do you want people to take away from like, what do you want people to leave having read the book with? Well, for me, um, I'm kind of going on the premise that there are people who have a similar experience as me when they're younger and approaching like witchcraft or the occult. And um, when you first go in learning, there are ideas in your mind, like, well, it has something to do with the devil and Satan. Like for me, when I was a kid, I had this, like, I just loved all the devil imagery and Satan stuff and devil stuff. And um, I don't know why I just did. And then as I got older and I discovered actual, like, books on modern witchcraft in, like, the 90s. Um, and I and those books written then were, like, witches do not believe in Satan. We don't worship Satan. We're, we believe in things older than the devil, et cetera. And it was really like, they really beleaguered that point, understandably because of satanic panic and stuff like that. And so in my mind, I was like, oh, I love witchcraft. I love the devil, but I can't, they don't go together. So I have to not, I have to abandon my obsession with the devil 
and focus instead on older gods. That's what witchcraft is. Mm -hmm. That's what I was taking from these books. And um, I just, it didn't, like, I learned a lot from all of that. And I had a lot of really cool experiences in that way. But ultimately, like, I was like, there's got to be a way to combine what my upbringing has been. I've grown up in like a predominantly Christian society. And so these things like the Christian devil have meaning for me, Mm -hmm. like it or not. And so that kind of prompted me to look into it more and research, you know, what is the devil? And it's, it's an archetype that's always been around. Mm -hmm. And there's some surprising things in there about um, the devil not always being the bad guy, you know, in many Mm -hmm. cases, he's intellect and creativity and a light bringer. And, um, a symbol of revolt mm-hmm. in a good way. So, yeah, I hope that anyone going into reading it can kind of like um, get rid of misunderstandings about the intersection between witchcraft and the devil. Like there can be one. It's not like not allowed, you know, <laughs> and especially when you look at history. I mean, witches have been associated with the devil, like it or not, right. since forever. So yeah. just the way it is. I, you mentioned like the the confessions, um, I guess I should say tortured confessions of, you know, during the witch trials. And that was that was the basis of why they were being accused. And then they get them to talk about under torture about their, you know, cavorting with the devil, I guess, in different ways. So, yeah, it's um, but I think I too, I see like in like contemporary witchcraft now, like this. um and I, I often wonder if this isn't also a reflection of well, what we're dealing with in reality, that there is this like more openness to dealing with like the shadow side of things. Like there's definitely been a resurgence in in traditional witchcraft that involves like the man in black or, you know, the devil at the crossroads, whatever people, the witch's devil, whatever they want to call it. Or the witch father, I think, you know, another term, but. I feel like it's almost a reaction to like reality in some ways that we're more willing to look at that. So I feel like your book is well-timed in that way. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. Um, there's, I notice a lot more traditional witchcraft and like you say, the, the witch father and those sorts of things. I'm not, I don't know tons about mm-hmm. traditional witchcraft. I don't consider myself like a traditional witch. Um but I see a lot of it and especially shadow, shadow work, shadow magic stuff. Um, I think that was happening before my book. Like mm-hmm. that was just something. And I agree. I think it's the times we're living in and like we live in pretty dark times, honestly. Like, and we have to think about those things mm-hmm. yeah. as, you know. Yeah. And I think, you know, like those of us who are old enough to have grown up like in either in, during the satanic panic like me or like in the shadow of it like 90s kids you know that there was that tendency to kind of push anything dark away because you know you just didn't want like people like you said in your book people went to jail you know like it it was not you know people got their kids taken away you know stuff happened so it's not like it was an uncalled for reaction i guess but um, one of the things I thought was interesting is how you bring up that we're kind of in this new or even echo of the satanic panic with like the conspiracy theories around certain people that we won't necessarily bring up and invoke in this podcast. But, um, you know, I think that with that, that it is happening in the age of social media has really changed the conversation around it. Like people are much more willing to fight back than they were in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, definitely. I think now there's lots of platforms for people to fight back. You know, in in like the 80s, there was the newspaper, some VHS tapes handed out by like, you know, someone in your community. There was no real way for people to come together. And that's another thing about social media allows people who do want to fight back to do so as a group and Mm -hmm. band together in you know, refuse to let it happen again. So, I mean, I guess there's hope in that. Sometimes when I think about it happening again and you think to yourself, it's so ludicrous. It can't possibly happen again. The things Mm -hmm. people say are going on with Satanists and these 
reptilian elite people. Like it's just, you think to yourself, there's no way people believe that, but they do. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's I, like, sometimes that kind of really gets me down thinking about like, what is going to happen with human beings? Uh, but when you consider that, you know, we all do have a way to bring in the other side and refuse to let that happen. There is some hope in that. Yeah. That's maybe a good thing about social media. Sometimes I like really don't like it, but that's one of the good parts, I guess. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, there are a lot of things about social media I don't like too, but I do think that idea of being able to find community to talk about things has been a gift of social media, despite the baggage that comes with it sometimes. But yeah, I mean, I just think about like when you said, how can people believe that? And, you know, when you look at the stories that came out of the 80s and 90s satanic panic, like literally these things were impossible. Like hundreds of thousands of children have gone missing. Like, no, (laughs) like there's no proof of that. And then, you know, it's pretty much debunked by 92, but people were still clinging on to that and and are clinging on to those ideas even now from that original piece. So and and now it's, you know, like you said, tunnels under Pete's parlors and what else, you know, is going on. So it's it's funny to me that we seem to have this cyclical cyclical relationship with these conspiracy ideas. Yeah, there is. And I notice that happens with witchcraft as well. Sometimes Mm -hmm. witchcraft is like a big, uh, like a trend kind of, and then it Mm -hmm. dies out and then it comes back. Like I've seen that a couple of times now. Mm -hmm. Um, But maybe when these kind of conspiracy ideas come out more during difficult times or when there's a lot of um, division in the society Mm -hmm. you're living in and things like that, I I don't know why that might be, but that kind of seems to be the case i don't know i don't know why this happens why do people do what they do yeah i don't know i mean there's probably a whole podcast series in that i mean i've listened to a couple of podcast series on that topic so yeah i think it's there there's so much about like social contagion idea and like just panics in general like we've had so many panics about different things throughout history and you know from like the red scare of the 50s to the satanic panic you know like it's we seem to almost want to have this big bad like culturally and it, the finger yeah, just gets pointed at that, different people. I think that's useful to people as well. It gives them mm-hmm. sort of a scapegoat for everything that's wrong or everything that they don't understand or that frightens them a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's a scapegoat for it. It's, it's othered. It's them. It's, mm-hmm. it's the Satanist. It's whoever you're pushing off to the side. There's always someone. And I think also, when people are frightened or whatever, don't understand something, they also like to have their ideas affirmed, mm-hmm. which is the whole echo chamber thing that happens to everybody on social media. You just get shown more of what you already believe and, and it just kind of blows up and people support one another's ideas. And yeah, it's like a contagion. Nobody, they're, they're just like, it gains momentum and nobody stops to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Or like, hold on, there's no proof. There's million or thousands of children in satanic cults, but where are all the, where are like the bodies of all these murdered people from these cults and things like that? Like nobody even mm-hmm. asked. Yeah. Which is pretty, you know, and when, with um, the McMartin preschool trial, which was where there was a daycare center and people who were, they were accused of being a satanic cult. And the children who went there were coerced into saying things that they had been taken through tunnels. They had been included in rituals. I think they got them to say that they had been forced to like murder people. And they also would say things like, oh, there was people flying and things like that. Um, the people who were accused of that, like I think one of them was in prison for 10 years waiting for trial. And in the end, um, you know, people believed in that the whole time. There was no proof. They went and they dug underneath the place and there was no tunnels. Like it was just so debunked again and mm-hmm. again. And people still believe that's real, mm-hmm. despite having all of this information that it's not. Yeah. And, and how many ruined lives in the wake of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people, I don't know, I see little bits of that kind of surfacing again. And that's really kind of terrifying. Yeah. And the thing that has always gotten me like reading about that, and I can't remember the case in Canada, there was a a 
really famous one in Canada. CBC did like a documentary about it a couple of years ago. But um, like how traumatized were those children? Yeah, to, to I know. have been told those things or made to believe those things by the adults who are supposed to be protecting them. Like that part also really worries me like about how how much damage they were not because these things really happened to them but because they were made to believe it was or that they were telling those stories i mean that's pretty horrific imagery to put in a child's head it really is i wonder i don't know i i wonder what happened to them i wonder Mm -hmm. yeah it'd be interesting to see how that impacted them or hear from them but probably also really awful to discuss Especially yeah. if they were convinced, no, this really happened. Yeah. I mean, they're they're traumatized either way, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just a, I don't, I would love to think that we could get past this, but like, like we've said, you know, it seems to be cyclical. Like we might get past this one, but what's the next one look like? <laughs> yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. I don't know. It's It's a little disheartening, but you know, I think at some point in your life, you realize you've seen the ups and downs. Like you said, we've seen the witch trend come and go a couple times and you just start to realize that these are just how things go (laughs) like yeah and you know there's always i remember watching like the um, talk shows like daytime talk shows like Mm -hmm. geraldo rivera and stuff like that and he had these like satanic cults exposed shows like i remember Mm -hmm. watching those and even as i i was pretty young like probably 12 years old or something and even i as a 12 year old was like "Mm." That can't be right. Doesn't seem real. So, yeah. You know, I, I want to have faith that most people can look at, like, I want to think it's a minority who mm-hmm. believe these things. Yeah. But they might be a very loud minority. So that's a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. The loud minority. I, I was thinking, like, especially when you brought up, like, you know, D&D was part of that, like, big, like, oh, it's going to turn people, you know, it's making people wizards. It was the same stuff that came out when Harry Potter was popular and, and you know, that whole wave of magic books for young adults kind of thing but we it, when high school we played we played D and you know we had one guy in our friend group who whose family had enough money that he could buy the books basically and then his mother watched one of those Geraldo specials and basically took everything out in the field and burned it so we couldn't play D anymore no way yeah. <laughs> and i was like okay i've actually played D and i know that this is garbage you know like it was just so obvious like, why are people believing this stuff that isn't true when, you yeah. know, like you said, as a kid, you got it, but adults are convinced and you're just like, how is this? Yeah, is this I don't thing? know. I think there's something they don't understand that frightens them and it gives them a scapegoat ultimately. Mm-hmm. And that could be anything. It could be something within themselves they haven't dealt with. It could be the things in the world they're seeing and don't understand. Who knows, but it gives them a way to dump the problem into something else instead Mm -hmm. of maybe looking inward and dealing with something that's wrong or where that's coming from. Uh, So in your research, were there, did you find things that surprised you or like, because you went down a lot of rabbit holes for this book, I think, to, to kind of put this together. So what, like, was there anything that you just came away with like, oh, wow. (laughs) Hmm. Not necessarily about the satanic panic about any of it. Was there anything that really surprised you? Huh, let me think. I was surprised by um the link between poisoners and it being like an well, they they that was like the first alleged satanic cult. So it was in France in like I should know the year. I don't remember the year, but it was a very long time ago. People were poisoning. It was like right before the revolution, right? It was like right before the French Revolution. Yes, there was, you know, there was a king and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was, it's called the Affair of the Poisons. And there was um, this this woman called the neighbor in English. And she was known for being like the best at, you know, handing out curses or doing spells poisoning people that you wanted poisoned. She also delivered babies and was a midwife. She provided birth control and things like that. Um, And someone had from from the like royal court had gone to her seeking poison, supposedly to poison the king at the time. And 
So this all came out and a huge trial happened where people were once again tortured into confessing to things. And this was the first time that it was recorded that there was Satan worship going on. The devil was there. There was all this stuff going on, uh, but there was no supernatural element to it. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it stand out because technically maybe it happened because there was no alleged you know, people flying, people walking through walls, any of that supernatural mm -hmm. part of it. It was like, no, they lit candles. There was a lady acting as an altar. They took the baby in out of the room, but they were giving it to the devil. And um, they said she would take babies as sacrifices and bury them in her garden and things like that. But everything that they were accused of doing was technically possible. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it stands out as the first satanic cult and from there when you look at the accusations of satanic cults over time after that it reflects what they were accused of mm -hmm. there's there's elements that are the same yeah yeah and like so i thought that was interesting i there, there's a book like this like several inches thick about the affair of the poisons that i read for that and it's really interesting i think if you're anyone who's curious about that end of things should read that book it was really mm -hmm. neat and detailed yeah, oh, that was one thing I was going to say about your book. Like, I have a whole new list of books to add to my TBR pile that will probably fall over and kill me in my sleep one night. But <laughs> I was just like, oh, there's so many books now I want to read. Um, and that was one of them, the book of the the kind of story of the Fair of the Poisons. One of the things that I thought was really interesting about that I did not know is that's where Anton LaVey got a lot of his psychodrama imagery was from that, those trials. Like, that yeah, was a, that was a link for my brain that I didn't know about. Yeah, the um the woman, he would have like a a woman act, act as an altar in his mm -hmm. rituals, like a naked person. And uh, that was from the Affair of the Poisons, because supposedly that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was I was surprised by that, too. I was like, oh, I see now. <laughs> yeah, like uh, nothing new under the sun or the moon, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I um I don't know. I haven't read a lot about Anton LaVey like I kind of got interested in the history of it just because we moved to the west coast and are closer to San Francisco and I was like oh I had forgotten that the house had been torn down but um like I was I was kind of fascinated with that era of how like all of these very famous people got involved with him like almost as this like I I don't even know it's almost like shock value of it I guess to be involved with his with the church of Satan or what, you know, his ideas about things. And that again, like the satanic temple or the temple of Satan, you know, that they, there is, these are not what people think they are. Like once you scratch beneath the surface, like it's not what is assumed, but the name is the shock value. Yeah. I think um, like Anton LaVey definitely understood how to put on a show and how mm -hmm. to get attention and how to do that end of things. I don't, I mean, I think that he did have like a thorough understanding, obviously, of Satanism. He was a Satanist. He was like the quintessential Satanist. Mm -hmm. um, but he also knew how to like, yeah, it was almost the celebrities doing it. I believe I heard that he like hung out with Marilyn Monroe a bunch of times and stuff like that. And um, but yeah, I think people wanted to associate with him sort of as a I don't know. I think he was probably quite charming for real, but also it was probably like publicity of a sort, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. To no no with him. press is bad press kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And for the Satanic Temple, they're pretty well known, but I think a lot of people more than ever before, probably um, people are coming to understand like what Satanism is and what the devil represents much more than ever before and how it is definitely different than what you know this conspiracy theory theory side of things which is like out of this world bloodbath insanity and then it's actually very rational <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's people so, who basically want the separation of church and state and to be able to be right and don't believe in magic or superstition in any way yeah yeah it's um yeah, and I think it has a bad name still. Like, I still I still see that. Like, even what you said with, like, well, and it's like, we don't want to book about Satanism. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the Satanic Temple, they're, Satan in that organization is, like, the literary Satan, mm -hmm. which is, like... Um, the, the Satan of Paradise Lost. 
Pardon? Yeah, Paradise Lost, like all yeah. of that, the symbol of rebellion and revolt and thinking for oneself and questioning, you know, arbitrary authority and mm-hmm. challenging norms. So I've enjoyed watching everything that they do over time. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's it's fascinating to me, like kind of like what we talked about, like, you know, overtly the culture that we grow up in is heavily, you know, in Canada and the United States is very um, influenced by Christianity. Like there's no way around it. Like even if you don't grow up going to church or practicing Christianity, you're still surrounded by the holidays and, and all of that stuff. And when you think about like, how do you, how do you call that into question? Like you have to do it within the construct of that. Right. And I think that's why things like Anton LaVey's Church of Satan and the Satanic Temple get so much pushback is because they know exactly like this is the thing that will trigger people, (laughs) you know, this imagery, because that's the cultural overlay that this is the bad side or the evil side. They're like, wait, you know. That's not how this yeah, exactly works. Definitely. Yeah. It um it works. I think that also though, I think many people who are members of these are genuinely Satanists. Like it's not just mm-hmm. for show. You know, they understand the concept of Satanism and mm-hmm. what it means and what the devil symbolizes, um, not as a deity, but what you know, the concept of the devil that mm-hmm. is behind all of these actions they take. Um it just happens to work out well, I think. Yeah. 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 It's fascinating to me. I mean, it's not something, I mean, I think, and you bring this up in the book to like, you know, depending on how you grow up, like stepping into this realm of thought can be deeply uncomfortable because you are socially programmed, you know, even if you didn't grow up like overtly Christian, I guess. And it was saying just like my own reaction to things. And it's like, you know, intellectually, like I get all of it and it's interesting and I can read about it. And then there's still that part of me that is socially programmed to go to step back, even in that and kind of acknowledging that and examining it has been really interesting. Yeah, I um, I found I find like I was I, I grew up in a household that was not religious at all, but I was surrounded by Christian culture. Like that's just the way it was. Mm-hmm. And so things were kind of indoctrinated into me that were based in that, even though we weren't religious. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, it was a lot of like, what is it? It was like gender norms and things like that. Like a woman's job is this, you're supposed to behave like this. You shouldn't dress like that or else, you know, you're a whore and like Mm -hmm. all this stuff. And it was beyond that. Like it was just, there's so many things that can be traced back to like religion and when you think about those things, those norms and how you, you know, behave like this, do that, you're kind of like, well, why? Why do I have to do that when I wasn't like, I don't even believe in that. Mm-hmm. And that's where it comes from, you know? So that's been something I have to really like reframe when I'm going through life and I automatically do things like the way that I learned to do them and behave with, you know, I have a child. I don't want them to also do that. Mm-hmm. I have to like stop myself and be like, no. Don't, yeah, you know, repeat what your parents did <laughs> yeah. and what you learned growing up because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't even apply to our lives now, my yeah. life. And, um, you know, and it doesn't do you any good either to follow a lot of those things. A lot of them are harmful, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. I liked the section in the book um, where you kind of talk about, um, I guess, the pushback against that, like self-care and body positivity and these things that are not what most people would even consider like the, the virtues of Satanism. Right. But are, we're much more accepting about it as we pushed away those Christian ideas about you must always sacrifice your needs and wants to someone else. You must think you are broken and unworthy. And we've really pushed back against that. And I, I, that was probably the part of the book where I just kind of set the book down for a second. It was like, I had not even, this had not even occurred to me that there was even that, you know, it was just a, a, a really eye opening section of the book. Yeah. Like historically speaking, anything um, of the body, the physical realm, material things weren't godly, right? You were mm-hmm. supposed to try to be very like spiritual, pure things that had to do with the body, like sex or beauty or even like 
enjoying food would be called gluttony, you know, mm-hmm. like all of those things. Those were bad, so, like focus on spirituality only. And so I think that's, I know for me, like the idea of growing up of body positivity wasn't a thing. And if you were to be like, yeah, I'm really beautiful or I really like my body, people would, that was bad. You were conceited. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you can't talk like that. How, and um, what else? Like the idea of self-care, taking a day for yourself. That was unacceptable. That was lazy. That mm-hmm. was like selfish. That was, you just don't do that. And um, I'm glad to see that mentality shifting mm-hmm. because really when you consider both of those things, what is the reason why we aren't, why can't you care about yourself? Why can't you consider yourself beautiful? And I don't know the answer where where I got that from. I mean, it's just, I was taught it from the time I was born and like, mm-hmm. Those, I think, to me, can be traced back to like religious stuff yeah. of, you know, don't focus on the material. But um, yeah, so in terms of thinking about things that of the devil, historically speaking, the devil was these earthy things and all of these sinful things like gluttony and lust and all of that. Um, so therefore, I think like self-care and, you know, loving your loving yourself, loving um carnal things enjoying earthly pleasures those are all in the devil's realm Mm -hmm. and you know they're all pretty great yeah and i I think it's interesting because that it like i feel like i'm probably going to read the book again honestly because i kind of had to speed read you know for the interview but um i think that also ties back to that idea of like how once christianity moved into europe that the devil was already part of that but then became conflated with these older pagan deities. And because you think about like Bacchus and Pan and how they kind of became demonized, I guess, by Christianity. And then mm-hmm. those Im- the images of Satan took on those characteristics of those. And those were gods of sensual pleasure, you know. So it's it's interesting to me how it's all kind of tied together. And like, I think... You, I think you could probably write a whole nother book about it just on like the social and anthropo- anthropological like fallout of these things. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, yeah, because there was a, a time where there was, you know, it took a long, long time. So there was a level of syncretism as well, where they were mixing together a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah, And that's not to say it was all good. It wasn't. But um, yeah, that is pretty interesting, that crossover. And then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of people, there's a misconception that it was done like quickly and like all of a sudden Christians came along and they killed all the pagans and turned their old gods into the devil. But what I read was that the old gods, when they came across like the temples or statues and things like that, they just thought that like Christians thought that they were full of demons, Mm -hmm. not that they were gods at all but that they were full of Christian demons and that they were false idols and they were mm-hmm. empty. Yeah. Except for these demons. So it wasn't a conscious like, yeah, let's, let's take all their gods and turn them into bad guys. It was like a little more, a little more nuanced than that, but it's all pretty interesting. Yeah. Like the history of it, the history of like the Christianization of Europe in general is kind of interesting to me. Well, really interesting to me, not kind of, but um, yeah, I think that idea that, you know, it was just like a wave and it was over. And I was like, no, I mean, like, you know, Scandinavian places in Scandinavia held out until like the eight and nine hundreds, you know, it wasn't immediate at all. So, yeah, yeah, no, it was just fascinating. And like, I, um, I also, but I also want to talk about your first book a little bit, if that's okay, because I think yeah, it's, sure. it's an interesting because one of the things when, and, and Kate and I talked about this a little bit before we got on the recording, I read A Blood and Bones with one of my book groups. And um, just one of the things I really enjoyed about that book is thinking about, because I feel like a lot of modern witchcraft focuses so much on the full moon, like on celebrating the full moon. And that to me has always felt like that energy of the full moon is really overwhelming and tiring for me. I've always kind of been a dark moon girl and um, I just really appreciated the focus on that in the book and the practicality of like the you know 
crafting and spell work and stuff that you have in that. And so I just kind of wanted to give you an opportunity to plug that book too, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So of Blood and Bones, working with Shadow Magic and the Dark Moon is about, like you say, the kind of dark phase of the moon. And it started off as it was based on like journals that I had been writing during the course of my mother's illness and passing. And it just sort of, because I was experiencing this kind of dark cycle in my life, mm -hmm. it led to all of the things you find in there when you're having that. And it came together in book form. And while I was doing that, um, witchcraft, of course, plays into everything I do. And I started thinking about that in terms of witchcraft. And I was like, yeah, you know, there aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of information about that phase of things. And it's just as important as the full moon phase for magic and in our lives, you know? Mm -hmm. And that period of like follow and emptiness is actually where I think most of the growth happens. It just is a painful experience sometimes. Growth can yeah. kind of not feel that great. But um, I think it's in spirituality and in our daily lives, one of the most important parts. Like when you think back on your life and the things that you learned the most from and the things that shape you as a human, as a person, it made you stronger. It's usually kind of the the difficult things, mm -hmm. you know? So all of the witchcraft in that book is focused on that sort of. And I also put things in it that I... I knew people would not, people might find it a little bit gross. There's parts that are like gross in that book. There just is. Talks about, you know, blood and insects and all that sort of stuff. But I hadn't seen it anywhere. And I thought, well, mm -hmm. it might benefit someone. Someone yeah. might like this stuff that I came up with. Yeah. And uh, it it has, I've gotten some feedback about it that really is really nice to hear that people mm -hmm. do understand it and not a lot of like, oh my God, what did she, that's disgusting. So that was pretty nice. Yeah. No, I do think, I, I really think we're in this time of like really examining, like you said, that kind of fallow growth period. And, you know, I just, I think because we have such a binary view of the world sometimes about light and dark and, you know, forgetting that, that it's a balance. You can't have one without the other kind of thing. And so I think they're like, while this like cultural stuff is going on, that's very heavy and difficult to deal with and all that. And then people kind of internalizing that and looking at it again, I just think you're kind of like right in the zeitgeist right now. So I think a lot of people, especially in the cult world are looking at like, how do we change and grow and organize even in the face of what feels like is coming, you know, so I, I th it all kind of makes sense to me that it plays into that. Yeah. And I think like um, the archetype of Satan and devil and Lucifer really fits all of this right now as well. Mm -hmm. Like um, everything is so polarized. There's, as we discussed, like kind of a large group of people wanting to fight back against things that are, you know, oppressive and wrong. And there's, I can, I don't know, it feels like a big uprising kind of, mm -hmm. and um, Lucifer as, you know, the light bringer and the ultimate adversary, um, much like in the romantic era is, is a symbol of that. It's a symbol mm -hmm. of fighting back. And so it's interesting to see his whole image making another round too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, even like in pop culture and stuff, it shows up. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm so yeah, it's it's interesting times, whatever mm -hmm. those may mean. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so before we get to our game of chance question, I wanted to give you an opportunity to just kind of tell folks like where they can find out more about your work, what else you've got going on. And reminder, this will come out in October. Um, but yeah, just let folks know where to find you if you want to be found. Okay. So um my website is katefruler.com. Um, there's not a ton on there right now. I plan on having some blogs and things like that come out on there. I plan on creating some artwork and things like that and selling it on there. And then my Instagram is at katefruler. And um, I don't have a ton of things to plug except for my books. I got a blood, a blood and Bones. Mm -hmm. And then coming out in August is magic at the crossroads the devil in modern witchcraft and that's wherever wherever you get books yep 
and well, I'll have links for that in there too. And I, we didn't really touch on your artwork, but um, just from what I saw from the website, it's um, I really like the like candy color versus demons kind of approach in your artwork. So yeah, I'm I'm kind of obsessed with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely go check it out. It reminds me, like the, I think there was one at this, like the demon collage with like all the bright colors. And I was like, it kind of reminds me of like that 60s, 70s poster art. Like there, you can see the influence of that. Yeah. I have a, I have a weakness for creepy, weird, old vintage stuff. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's like, like a witchcraft almost have to, right? (laughs) (laughs) You're drawn to one, you're seem to be drawn to the other, uh, or like weirdly Victorian things. Um, but yeah, that's great. And um, so for our last question, I always joke that uh, because I'm a Scorpio, I don't know how to do small talk. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always want to ask people like deep, dark questions when I meet them. So this is an opportunity to do that. Okay. I'm going to roll a die. And depending on what number I roll, we've got a question about death, sex, religion, politics, or money. And if I roll a six, you get to pick what you want. Uh, and the questions great. relate to your work. I mean, they're not completely out of left field. They kind of relate to your work or you know, witchcraft in general. And um, you can pass if you want. All right. (laughs) Let's see what we get. Two, sex. Oh. (laughs) Haven't really touched on that. (laughs) You in? Sure, I guess. So weirdly, the same day I finished your book, I also saw a post somewhere about the Geef brothers statues of Lucifer in Belgium about they commissioned. I think the story is they commissioned the older Geef brother to do a statue of Satan for the cathedral. And they said, and he was like, I'll give it to my little brother and he can do it. And then when they revealed it, they're like, Satan's too hot we would like a different statue. And then the other brother the, who was supposed to do it originally did his statue and it was even hotter, like even yeah. more sexualized. And their, their thing was that it was too sublime, that Lucifer was too sublime and he was distracting to young women in the congregation. Oh, wow. So I was thinking about that in like context of your book and this idea of like the anti-hero in modern culture and how prevalent that has become. And then kind of Lucifer or Satan or the devil steps into that role in a lot of pop culture. So I was wondering if you have a favorite, like sexy Lucifer, sexy Satan in pop culture. Ah, let me think. I don't know if I have a a favorite one. I know the statue you mean. That's a pretty nice statue. Um, I did. I read about that story too. I was like, oh, that's so funny. Um, I don't know. There's that show Lucifer Mm -hmm. where the devil is supposed to be like that guy. He's quite dapper and handsome and everything. But I I don't know if he's my type in that show. I'm trying to think of other Lucifer. He's very slick. Like, I I see why people find him attractive, but he's not my type either. Yeah. Um, I don't really know. I mean, what other sexy devils are there? I guess there's the Witches of Eastwick had Jack Nicholson, but no. Also not my type. (laughs) No. (laughs) And what I also think about, oh, what is the actor's name? He he also plays Chernabog in the American God series, but he plays Satan in the Constantine movie with Keanu Reeves. Oh, I don't think I saw that. He's quite good in that. And then, like, Al Pacino has played Satan. Hmm. Like, I mean, it's generally... There was an American Horror Story season that was about Satan. Mm-hmm. And they had this, like, beautiful guy. He was a beautiful guy, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um. What I will say about that season, this has nothing to do with the question, but they had Anton LaVey in that season, like somebody playing Anton LaVey. And mm-hmm. it was, I was immediately like a little bit horrified because they made him this like groveling, trembling guy who was like, I can't believe I'm meeting the devil. And he was like, your highness and bowing down on the ground and all of this stuff. And that is like the opposite of yeah. what a Satanist does. But yeah. um, well, plus Anton LaVey was like, so about power and ego and like i that seems really weird to me to portray him that way i haven't seen that season 
Yeah, that seems well, weird to portray him that way. The person who wrote that part maybe really just disapproved of him and didn't like him and was like, "Ha ha." I mean, I'm gonna I make him. There are like some a, things about him that are, yeah, not particularly savory. Like that's true. I mean, he was definitely kind of a sexist dude of his time. <laughs> oh yeah, so. definitely. He had a lot of ideas that didn't age well. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, I don't know. Like when I think about Lucifer and the Devil in movies, most of them are sort of like. I don't know if I was going to make like a sexy Satan guy. They don't match what I would think of it as, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I'm not, to be honest, I'm not quite sure how I would think of it. Yeah. When it comes to, I don't know, sexuality and the devil, I know that. I mean, one of the biggest sins is all, all of the sexual things are sinful, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, maybe that's part of why they always make the devil like this really beautiful, attractive, sexy guy, I guess. Yeah. I was thinking they always make it like a dark haired man or sometimes even a black man will portray Satan because they have this idea of darkness. And I think the thing that I find interesting is when you think about Lucifer and like the Brothers Geef statues, like I always think of him as blonde. Yeah, when people are light, like, you know, like a light, like angelic, like honestly, like I think Tilda Swinton would be a great Satan. (laughs) So Yeah, I think of it the same way. Lucifer specifically would be like, I think of the color yellow and brightness. And yeah, it's kind of weird. I actually I envision that statue that we talked about, to be Mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. 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 Which is funny because in Constantine, Tilda Swinton plays Gabriel. But like she would have been a great Satan to you. (laughs) Yeah. Like the ultimate androgynous kind of. Yeah. Like um, Lucifer was morning star. Mm -hmm. The morning star is Venus and Venus is Aphrodite. So, yeah. And there's um, the devil is portrayed as a woman a lot, too. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of non-gendered, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that part of it, too. And uh, I did appreciate that you brought that up in the book is that there's really like a lot of cultural things that have gotten attached to the idea that don't quite match up with the reality of like the religious texts these ideas come from. Like, I feel like a lot of people's idea about Satan really does come from Paradise Lost and not from biblical texts or Jewish texts or even, you know, Islamic texts. It's really Paradise Lost is like their image of Satan. Yeah. Um, art and literature definitely have formed what we think of as the devil or Lucifer now, for sure. Like, I think, like you say, it's more from those things in many cases than from religion at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, like, that's part of it. And you see all this Satan imagery now in like, um, well, what was it? The one where he's like sliding down a pole and at the end he like snaps the the little Nas X video. Yeah, that one. Or, Or Yeah, yeah. And then there was like a Grammy performance where that had everyone upset because it was like depicting hell and devil stuff and everything like that. But I think that's all, you know, mm-hmm. the devil is like half pop culture, half religion. And it's like mm-hmm. an interesting mix in ways that other religious icons are not. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, because you think about like, there are a lot of like, I was just thinking about like how many brands use use or actually called the devil something or they use like little imp or devil imagery as like their logo like even like vacuum cleaners like there's so many things that and then the opposite would not be true like people would not have like you know a jesus vacuum cleaner but they would have a dirt (laughs) devil you know and it's just weird to me that we like incorporate that imagery and stuff i mean this is pretty far away from sex talking about vacuum cleaners but um, That's okay. <laughs> but like I said, we but tend no, to go down rabbit that holes. Is interesting. Yeah. I never thought about that. You don't have like Virgin Mary ice cream. I've seen devil ice cream and mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's just, Wonder it's funny that. to me, the, the permutations, I guess, of imagery mm-hmm. throughout time and like what we use to sell things and how capitalism impacts all that. Like, I'm sure we could have like another hour conversation about that. <laughs> well, I mean, it says something about the devil in that he... You know, he's charming and appealing and he sells products, you know, you stick mm-hmm. them on a product and it sells much like, you know, sex sells. Yeah. So in that way, it does relate to sex. There you go. The there yeah. you go. Aren't our devils sexy? Yes. Next conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so thank you, Kate, so much for coming on and for being game to talk about this. And, you know, I think like in context of what you said, like just putting yourself out there, I think it's 
it's cool what you're doing. So, well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Witch Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press and is edited by Julian Rashke. Our intro music is Cosmic Glow by Andrew K. And our outro music is Voices by Alexander Shinekar. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com. And you can follow us on Instagram at witchlitpod. Please help other witches find us by leaving a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to and reading Witch Lit.